So hello and welcome to another episode of Stone Mandeville Plastics with me, James K.K. Chen. And me, Rebecca Shirley. And the purpose of our webinar series is to explore the cutting edge of plastic surgery. And today we'll do this by looking inward and question the very basis of our practice as plastic and reconstructive surgeons. We'll delve into the ethics that govern how we approach our patients and what we do to and for them. For me, this is so important because we come across so many ethical dilemmas in our everyday life. And if we take this topic seriously enough, and if we're willing to be honest with ourselves, this leads to some pretty uncomfortable questions quickly, and sometimes even existential questions about ourselves as people and as surgeons. Now, today we're extremely honored to be joined by a rare and and very distinguished expert, someone who can bring together the worlds of ethics, philosophy, and surgery, and guide us through this difficult journey. We've got Christian Berkler. Now, Christian is a pediatric plastic surgeon, and his clinical practice focuses primarily on pediatric plastic surgery, but also craniofacial deformities in kids and adults. His faculty member in the section of plastic surgery with a joint appointment in the departments of neurosurgery at Michigan Medicine. In addition, he serves as co-chief of the Clinical Ethics Service of the Center for Bioethics and Social Sciences in Medicine at the University of Michigan. And he's published extensively in both of these fields. So Christian, thank you so much for your time today. We're really looking forward to the discussion and there's so many topics we can talk about, but let's see where this takes us. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to everyone else for joining us as well. Um, so um, we're very lucky to have Christian. He's a very rare, in fact, I don't think I have met before today, an ethicist and plastic surgeon. So we're going to have a very interesting discussion. Um, this will be recorded. It will be on our Stoke Mandeville Plastics uh, website. And um, if you have questions, uh, Christian will also be very happy to answer them at the end of the discussion. So we're going to start by asking you, how did it come about that you took this training to become an ethicist and a plastic surgeon? We're interested to know a little bit more about yourself and what led you down your career path. Yeah, sure. You know, it's interesting. I, I sort of differentiated into someone who wanted to think about medical ethics long before I differentiated into a plastic surgeon. So when I was in my undergraduate studies, uh, you know, studying to become a, in a pre-med track, I was a biology major, and I was at a small liberal arts college where we had to study philosophy and theology and sociology and all these things. And one of the courses we had to take as a pre-med was bioethics. And it struck me as sort of an idealistic undergraduate student that you know, reading about philosophers and theologians and other people who didn't actually practice medicine and what they were writing, you know, we'd read these books and treatises on what was the right thing to do in medicine, and it did, it kind of struck me that they weren't actually taking care of patients. These are, you know, a lot of ethics texts are written by philosophers and people who don't actually, you know, sit at the bedside of or hold the hand of someone who's dying and certainly don't operate on people. So at that stage, you know, uh, in the mid '90s. Uh, I thought I want to be, no matter what I do, I want to be someone who actually understands this world of ethics and is a practicing clinician. And so I was not prepared to do that with a degree in biology. So I uh, stayed at my university and, and got a master's degree in theological studies and then went to medical school. After medical school, during my surgical training, um, we have some uh, an opportunity to do some like academic development or, or research and I chose to get a master's degree in bioethics and to do a fellowship in clinical ethics during that academic time uh, that was allotted to me. Um, and so then I uh, was able to delve a little more deeply into that during my general surgery training. And then I became a plastic surgeon and then a craniofacial surgeon uh, after that. Is there um, a link between the ethics and the plastic surgery? Well, you know, I love, I always, yeah, I think, well, I think all surgeons are making ethical decisions all the time. Um, and so, but it wasn't anything particular about plastic surgery 
or the ethics of plastic surgery, which drew me to plastic surgery. I think it's the best thing you can do with your life is to be a plastic surgeon. And uh, we do the most complicated operations. We do smaller anastomoses than cardiac surgeons. And we, you know, move tissues from one place to the other and, and reconstruct things. And we operate on bones. We have, so it's the best possible surgery you can do. So I guess maybe it's just my, um, whatever, strive for uh, to be the best version of myself that I can that led me into plastic surgery. <laughs> and the, the ethics was just because I, I thought it was, uh, you know, I was struck by that thought that there was it was inauthentic for people who didn't take care of patients to write about what's right and wrong in the, in the taking care of patients. So how does your training as an ethicist and, you know, you still work as an ethicist. Yeah. How does that shape your clinical practice? You know, I think it, I, I try <laughs> I'm, well, I'm thinking about ethics all the time, and actually, when I'm not in the cl in the clinic seeing patients, um, I help to run a clinical ethics service where we do ethics consultation, and we'll go to the bedside and try to solve ethical dilemmas, um, like in the intensive care units and that sort of thing. So my my day to day practice is sort of in incorporating all all of these things. Um, it's interesting though, in when I in my role as an ethics consultant, uh, essentially what we're doing is what I, I always say that when we do ethics, what we're trying to do is that we're engaging in disciplined reflection on moral ambiguities and trying to sort of scratch a little bit below the surface and, and see where there might be tensions and disagreements to see what's in, informing those disagreements to try to and then try to come to a resolution. Um, so in, when I'm doing ethics, I sort of take a 30,000 foot view of the situation. Again, in my clinical practice, I'm doing ethics because I'm living out what I think is hopefully um, you know, respecting my patients, uh, listening to them carefully, trying to help them make the best decisions that we can uh, regarding their surgery uh, and that sort of thing. So there's one where I'm like the actor and one where I'm sort of get to be the, the you know, commentator or analyst. <laughs> That's fascinating. I've never heard of an ethics um, consultant that goes to a bedside and try and solve ethical diet. Is that a um, common Thing to have in the no, I don't. I don't know what the. Uh, I think there's an international. Um, there's an international council of clinical ethicists, uh, and the meeting in Rome this year. Uh, but uh, so I think it exists in other, other, uh, um, other places. But it, it did kind of come about in the 80s in America, having um, sort of non clinicians at the bedside. So he was uh, initially like someone would call a philosopher and say. Um, is this patient still alive or, you know, and that, what should we do and that sort of thing. Um, but, but as it is now, I mean, I run a clinical ethics service where we have uh, faculty ethicists um, who you have, have uh, in, in my institution, we, t we tend to be clinicians who have additional training in ethics. Um, and then some people who have like, you know, degrees in law and also bioethics. And so we're on call 24 seven, 365 for ethical dilemmas. And so anyone can call us, and then we basically come and try to sort through uh, what the issues are and, and come to a resolution that everyone can live with. Do you think it affects the ethos in your plastic surgery department? Like, is it something that perhaps your other colleagues have become more aware of because of your presence in the team? And do you think you function differently because of that? Oh, I well, I hope so. I mean, I don't know. They, I think... Um, Certainly, they're subjected uh, to me talking about ethics more than they would, <laughs> than they than they would be if I wasn't here. Um, you know, as part part of the training uh, in surgery or in, in medicine that you're supposed to sort of cover certain, you know, they say like ethics and professionalism is something that every trainee is supposed to be trained in. And so I get asked to speak uh, a lot to different tr surgical trainees or or other trainees so that people can check the box that that people are getting their ethics education. Um, but I try to, I mean, my hope is that, that we're engaging in ethics discourse uh, more than, than if I wasn't here. I think that surgeons actually, as, as you guys mentioned earlier, we, we tend to have ethics discourse. We just don't label it as such. But, you know, talk in the surgeon's lounge about how to manage a case or how to um, think about a certain situation. Um, part of that is is struggling with moral ambiguities and um i think that's doing ethics so and i think what you said earlier what we talked about offline is um the importance of having some kind of framework and 
and the vocabulary to be able to engage in that kind of dialogue. Um, you touched upon a few things that I really want to just um, delve into a little bit more. Yeah. Um, and first of all, is um, just to lay out the foundations of this discussion. We talk a lot about ethics and we, people talk about the four pillars of bioethics, but could you tell us in, in your mind, in very kind of simple language, what medical ethics means to us as surgeons? And secondly, the difference between morals and ethics. Mm. That's tough. Uh, the, um, the, the four pillars of bioethics for people who don't know, I guess, is that, that this, was, this comes from a book written by a guy named Tom Beecham and, and James Childress called The Principles of Biomedical Ethics and its respect for autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. And, um, and so those are kind of considered the principles that we anyone could use. You could sort of just use these principles despite having different foundational commitments, let's say. Um, you can use these, what they label as mid-level principles to help specify what the right thing to do is in a given situation. And they say that ethical dilemmas occur when there's conflict between what to do in respecting each of these these pillars. Uh, and so a classic example is um, someone is refusing something that they that would be good for them. So the, what's conflicting is beneficence. The surgeon wants to do what's beneficent for the patient, but the patient's refusing. And so you're struggling with the beneficent thing will go against what the patient's autonomous wish is. And so there's a conflict there. So that's what people talk about, how to solve an ethical dilemma, try to specify what's which ones should be uh, you know, prioritized in a given situation. So, um, you know, that's sort of one way of, of doing ethics. It's, it's pretty, um, it's gained a lot of popularity and it's the one that most uh, physicians learn about. Um, when we think about medical ethics, uh, you know, there's a long history uh, of sort of physicians trying to behave themselves that it goes all the way back to the time of Hippocrates. You know, when you look at the whole Hippocratic corpus all the writings attributed to Hippocrates, about 50% of them have to do with how physicians should behave. And about 50% of them are how to set a bone and how to drain pus and, and that sort of thing and how to bleed in the right spot, someone. Um, but so I think that there's this idea of how to behave oneself uh, in, um, in the practice of medicine, which is sort of medical ethics. And, and there's a couple of, uh, uh, you know, English, English philosophers who wrote about this, uh, you know, in the 1800s. But um, when we think about medical ethics, it's kind of usually a set of rules um, to govern the, the behavior of, of physicians. As Have you taken a Hippocratic oath? Yeah, we do that. Well, yeah, I did. Um, my, my med school was, I went to med school before the turn of the century. So that was still a popular thing uh, uh, to do. Um, and, you know, medical student, they, they usually, most medical schools in, in the U.S., you take some sort of oath. Sometimes it's like a declaration or something, um, but um, some places we just use the good old Hippocratic oath. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the difference between morals and ethics? You know, uh, a lot's been written on that. I, I think most people use them interchangeably. Uh, some people would say that ethics has to do with a set of rules that govern behavior in certain contexts. Um, and that morals have to do like with sort of your personal beliefs and, and well, but, you know, I, I tend to use them interchangeably. I don't know that a, there's a lot of payoff in making fine distinctions in terms of, um, you might say, well, it's immoral to cheat on your spouse, uh, but you didn't break, you didn't break an ethical code or something, you know what I mean? But, I, but, but it's the wrong thing in general. I think that you know what what ethics and morals is having to do with is saying what's right and what's wrong uh, in a given situation. Or um, and ethics tends to go a little bit further in trying to justify why certain things might be right or wrong. Right, and, and, and so why uh, is the, the ultimate reason for why for, um, the out, the best outcome for the patients, or is there something higher up than that? I wondered whether how much of it is a theological thing. Yeah, well, that's a great question. You know, Plato asks those kinds of questions. You know, does does God say that something's good because it's good, or is it good because 
is there something intrinsic about it that God's recognizing or is it good because God says that it's good? And it's Plato asked that. It's like the youth thrift road dilemma. But anyway, the, uh, um, um, I don't have an answer to that. <laughs> no, no, I, mean, I, I just said uh, the reason I asked that is because we, we as surgeons are often in a place where we have to, you know, we try not to be judgmental, but ultimately we are judging and we're making oh, decisions yeah. based on people. We can't hide from that and pretend we're not. Um, right. And so, so it's difficult to square, you know, our role as, as doctors and, and also as kind of moral judges in a way um, in difficult clinical situations. Yeah, the way I, so I think, the way I think about it is that the surgeon has a responsibility. We pick up this mantle of the profession of being a surgeon that, that um, carries with it certain responsibilities to our patient. And the primary one is um, what I call a fiduciary responsibility to put the needs and the, the, the needs of the patient ahead of the needs of other considerations, particularly uh, considerations for yourself. So, um, and I, one example is in the, in, in the US, um, you might make more money by doing a free flap breast reconstruction than if you do uh, implant-based reconstruction. You might get, um, and so if you're making a decision and saying, I'm only gonna do free flap, free flap breast reconstruction because I will make more money that way, then you're putting the needs of yourself ahead of the patient. Uh, and so, you know, I think one, and so one of the things that we have to do is always, again, focus on the patient and figure out what the best thing is for them. And again, the, we have those, that responsibility or that ethical duty to the patient because of this um, responsibility that comes with the, the professionalism or the professional responsibilities that we have as surgeons and as physicians. Okay, and just, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm hogging this a little bit, um, Rebecca, but just to carry on on that theme about yeah. us as surgeons, particularly the plastic surgeons making yeah. um, decisions as to what's good. You know, you wrote a very interesting article in the American Journal of Ethics about the surgeon's role in defining what's normal genital appearance. You know, yeah. and so so a big part of at least what the public perceives, what the plastic surgeon does is a lot of appearance changing um, surgery. And um, so so just can you talk to us a little bit about that, our role in defining what's normal and what's acceptable to be done? Yeah, it's it's a. Uh... <laughs> It's a difficult um, thing that I think, you know, uh, I talk about it in, in that article specifically, you know, a lot of surgeons are very active on social media and have a big social media following. And so they might have millions of people or hundreds of thousands of people viewing their, uh, their content. And so I think, you know, you could, and so you may reinforce certain stereotypes of what is normal by your um, by that position of authority in some way, or just even um, saying I'm a plastic surgeon, this is a better way to be, and you know, well, and and what this is over here is that maybe normal is pathological uh, because in my hands I can make you better, and so I think that there's a there's there could be uh, abuse of that of that power, and so I I I often you know I I used to teach a course called philosophy of medicine. Um, at our at the University of Michigan, where I would teach undergrads, and I would ask them this question. We'd have a whole, you know, day's discussion on on what is it that you know? How do physicians in general sort of stress the idea that health is better than, or some ways of being are better than other ways of being? And, and does the existence of uh, certain uh, operations that everyone's getting make not getting that operation suddenly become abnormal? Um, and so, uh, you know, I think it, a, a lot of people will respond to that and saying, well, it's our society and culture that tells us what's beautiful, for example. And so surgeons are just responding to people wanting to look a certain way. But I think even the existence uh, of our ability to change people's appearance to, to meet a certain norm in some ways sort of says that's a good, it's a better way of being. Because if we didn't, then why would we participate in it, you know? Yeah. But it's, it's, it's a challenging thing. You know, a lot of this has to do, too, with, you know, uh, do we want to, you know, wring our hands about, like, how uh, complicit we are with, with certain things that aren't the best uh, or, 
or not. Again, um, I th there's an interesting thing about how the fathers of of rhinoplasty, um, you know, in New York City, their their main goal was to sort of make very ethnic noses look more like the uh, the typical, like say Irish or or uh, Caucasian nose, um, and how that sort of um, then re reinforced ideas of what someone should look like, you know, and it's uh, it's interesting. Yeah, and I, I suppose the um, the the etymology of the word plastic plasticos is the restoration of what it is to mold is to, to restore form and function, and we talk about that in our training a lot, and uh, and it's it's kind of artificial to pretend that form and function are two separate things. I mean, of course, right, we're yeah. all embodied beings, and and the um, form therefore plays a massive important functional parts of being, um, and. And uh, yeah, so so that's a kind of it's really difficult then to to say well, one one type of surgery is can be should be prioritized over something else because it's more functional. And uh, for, for that patient, it's just as important, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. I guess so. In 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 the U.S., you know, insurance companies won't pay for things that they are if they say there's no functional deficit. So. I'll have patients who may have a horrible malocclusion or, um, you know, really bad scarring. And they'll say, oh, well, you know, is the patient, uh, are they eating okay? And they, you know, and you say, well, yeah, they're, they're existing, but, they, but they're not flourishing. And I always, you know, what I often say about, I mean, because I primarily do craniofacial surgery, the purpose of the function of the face is to be the center of human communication, right? So if there is significant deformity, uh, or even sometimes modest deformity or differences in someone's face is going to impede their ability to communicate effectively. And so especially if a patient is voicing that their appearance is not is, is impeding their ability to, to kind of successfully communicate in the way that they want to because they they have these these differences in their face, then I think that you're restoring the function which is to of the face, which is to be the sex successful uh, center of communication mm. and that's that's how i tie in uh, you know facial appearance altering operations with function because again we're all i mean right we're not looking at anything past our shoulders here as we're talking to each other mm. so this is the this is where all the action is in the in communication with with other human beings and so changing that appearance that in a way that helps the patient it improves their their or uh, allows them to flourish uh, I think is is an important thing that actually improves function, human function. No one else just you know talks about it in that way, but, but I think it's I think it's a real thing. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's possible to get so caught up thinking about ethics that it almost just paralyzes you completely? So just thinking of an example, like in the UK, is that everybody is entitled to breast reconstruction. So that's seen yeah. as an operation that just is always allowed and any sort of alterations after that. But on the other hand, we see a huge number of patients with pressure ulcers and there's just so many of them waiting years for surgery and ethically, that sits very uncomfortably with me. So I feel that in a, on a personal front, once you start thinking about these things, you can just become so overwhelmed with ethics. And have you found that to be a problem for yourself? Well, <laughs> no, I think, well, yes. I mean, in some, well, in some ways, you sort of have to say, you know, what is it that I can do in the given situation? What is the scope of that I can actually, um, you know, make a difference in, and and how how much you're willing to to put yourself out there to change public policy uh, for certain things? I mean, I, I I do get involved in in certain issues with with our hospital policy and and how things are are, um, you know, how we we go about rationing scarce resources and things like that was something that I spent a lot of time on during the, the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, but, um, but at some point you have to act, you know, and as surgeons, we're obviously people of action, which is sort of what <laughs> we, we're unlike the sort of the internists who just sit and, and contemplate things and, and think about 
you know, replacing sodium and, and glucose and that kind of stuff. But I mean, well, the philosophers, we, we want to, yeah, philosophers, but we're also, you know, we want to, you know, act and, and do things. So I think maybe it's just my, um, oh, I don't know, the uh, overwhelming need to, to jump in and do something that prevents me from just being having the analysis, the paralysis of analysis. Um, and you jump between two beings, like you're the surgical acting, and then you go to the ethical contemplating. Do you find there's a split like that? or? Well, it's interesting. I Well, <laughs> we get called to solve ethical dilemmas, right? And so um, I, I often will say, um, you know, I will tell you the, I will map out for the person who's asking for an ethics consultation, like some guide rails. Here's some things. This is ethically impermissible. This is ethically over here, this is ethically impermissible. Here's a range of options that might be ethically permissible. Um, I know the right answer. I know what I would do, but that's not what you're asking me because you're the, if, when I'm trying to give a, um, you know, advice to, to or when we're trying to solve an ethical dilemma, I think that the clinicians involved and the patients, of, they have real skin in the game. You know, when I'm making decisions with my patients, it's the, my patients and I who have skin in the game. So. Um, so again, I try to, you know, when I'm when I'm the actor, I, again, I try to um, do the right thing with with my patients involved. And when I'm an ethicist, really, I'm not a, a player in in the actual scenario. So I get to sort of sit back, and I, I guess I'm able to switch uh, back and forth. I guess that's what makes me like philosophy, is that um, it's kind of sitting back. So. And, so you, you talked a bit about helping people make decisions, and th this could be, I suppose, the the um, healthcare professionals looking after the patient, but also the patients themselves and their families. Yeah. Um, but I wonder whether we can segue into the the whole issue of consent, because no one really, you know, you, you has complete full consent. The chasm between the surgeon or the medical profession and the patient is just fast; it just can't be bridged. You can't give them a whole postgraduate medical training within, you know, in, in their dying hours within 24 hours. So how, how does, how does con the whole issue of consent work and the ethics around that? And how do you support the, the clinicians involved? Yeah, I love this topic. And um, I haven't written a, my treatise on this yet. So this is, gives me an opportunity to uh, at least get it out in, in the open. But I mean, can, what we think we're doing with consent is like executing a contract, right? But what we're at, because we, we sort of say, okay, here's information, you're now informed, sign this document, uh, everything's gonna be okay now. And that sort of uh, satisfies some legal requirements, particularly in the US is uh, this idea of, of getting sued for damages if patients aren't consented properly and that sort of thing. It's where sort of that arose. But I think what consent really is, is it's an act that the, the patient trusts you to take care of them. Uh, and so that places the, the burden on the surgeon to actually be trustworthy. Uh, because as you say, <laughs> the, 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 the amount of knowledge that someone really would have to attain to truly understand Think the way things the way that you do, for example, it's just asking too much of patients to really do. I mean, they don't have the resources to do what we say we're doing, which is to inform them in a way that they can make an educated decision about about what's happening. And so, um, so it's a lot of work for the surgeon to help try to elucidate what the values are of the patient, um, make sure that the options that you're giving them are consistent with with what they're what they value. And if they're saying, yeah, sure, let's go ahead with, I'm, con I'm consenting to this, this procedure, that, that you're not, that, that, this, that it's a good decision that you can also live with. Um, you know, we, we uh, whenever we have our morbidity and mortality reports and we talk about, you know, bad outcomes and someone says, well, you know, I thought this was an operation was a bad idea, but the patient really wanted me to do it anyway, you know, and then it ended in a bad result. I usually raise my hand and say, that's completely unacceptable. You should never, you know, do an operation that you think, you know, that's, it's irresponsible to sort of put it on the patient to make a decision that you know is going to end in their harm. Um, but it is difficult, particularly, particularly when we're doing big operations, high risk yeah. surgery, 
where okay we we let's talk about you know the pillars of bioethics you talk the beneficence so potentially you can do good whatever you define as good for the patient but then to get there you have to do some sort of maleficence you have to do some harm to get there right, and so yeah. then, then then it depends on your values and the patient's values as to how much harm they're willing to undertake and the magnitude of the potential sequelae um that's a very difficult bag and and then when you finally if you did do harm how do, how do you then approach that whole situation in a morally responsible manner can you talk about that topic yeah i think the fundamental thing that we sort of you know again that's it is a journey that we take together with our patients yeah. you know i think that we have to think about it in in not merely contractual terms like oh you know you want this operation i'm a technician i'll perform this operation i think that's an impoverished view of what's taking place like when exactly what you're talking about is some patient who is a massive reconstruction and is going to be in the hospital for a long period of time and and, and may have devastating uh, complications along the way that you know part of our duty as surgeons is to be there with them along the way and to take care of them when they have a complication you know and so that that it's not just like an a la carte you're consenting to one thing but that they're actually that you're in it together with them to help them through that process so that they feel like they're not abandoned um, and also that you're taking responsibility for what you did to them. <laughs> uh, and because sometimes, you know, it's, that's, that's also difficult. You know, when you do a big operation, you have a bad complication. It's challenging to go back in the room and, and face the patient because you feel bad about yourself and, uh, because maybe, maybe something that you could have done, you thought you could have done better. Um, and those are hard, hard situations, but I think it's the, uh, moral responsibility um, of the of the surgeon to be there for the patient. I think that's kind of the fundamental thing that we have to. Um, it, it can be challenging, and sometimes yeah. these situations become very blurred. Like, for example, I can think of a situation I had where a patient wanted an operation, so made a complaint very high up for that mm -hmm. operation to be escalated, and it happened to be an operation that I was a bit unsure about, and I felt as a surgeon like to say, okay, you know what, I don't want to be involved anymore that just wasn't an option so mm. i think there can be real challenges uh, with these situations no it's, it's challenging I, I i always you know i think that yeah if there's no other surgeon to to do the operation it's it's uh and maybe it's challenging we in in our system you know we have and i've, I've written about this too where we've had uh you know patients who are significantly uh, more abundant, for example, and this isn't plastic surgery, like a cardiac uh, procedure, you know, and um, the, a group of surgeons here said, no, there's no way this person is going to survive this operation. We're not going to do the operation, but they found another surgeon at a different institution. So they transferred that patient, you know, in a helicopter to this other uh, hospital, and then they did the operation and the patient died. Um, and, and I think that's a tragedy and uh, a miscarriage of justice and, 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 and the other surgeons are probably behaving unethically and maybe arrogantly. But I, I think that fundamentally though, one of the things we have to be able to do is say, no, I won't do this operation uh, if we think that it's gonna um, only harm the patient with no chance of helping them. Now, again, that's pretty, that's actually a, a very, small amount of operations that they will have no chance of helping them uh, like this cardiac operation that I'm mentioning. But, um, you know, I, I try to say that I, I mean, I, I want to say, and I do that, that surgeons have to be responsible for our outcomes. We're, we're linked to our patients' outcomes in, in ways that we can't just shrug off. You know, we know when we pick up a knife, we're responsible for what happens afterwards. Mm. Mm. And, and, um, how about some kind of more plastic surgery uh, scenarios? You know, so so you've written about and you've been involved in the ethics surrounding transplantation, for example, face mm -hmm. transplants and uterus transplants. Uh, that process must have been grueling and taken a long time, huge panels and years of discussion. Can you share shed some light on on that process? Well, you know, I. Um... There's this sort of thing called the technological imperative, you know, that that if 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 a new technology is uh, invented, 
that there's like this energy behind it, this, this sort of, it will happen. If there's a new technique, it will be used. Uh, you know, if something comes into the world, we'll, it'll be enacted. We, we can't withhold ourselves. I mean, so that's what, uh, there's a philosopher named Jacques Ellul who describes this in this, his book, The Technological Society, um, where he sort of just describes how a new technique is developed, like there's this momentum with it. And, and we just as a society, how we function is that we don't ever say, well, maybe we shouldn't use that technique. I think that's sort of like some of these, um, uh, you know, VCAs or these, um, these composite tissue uh, transplants that, where, you know, we haven't really solved tolerance yet. Um, and yet we do um, transplants um, uh, for quality of life, things that may actually end up shortening people's quantity of life. And so um, it's a it's a complicated process to um, to figure out if you know when that might be an appropriate thing. And it seems like in in certain patients it is, uh, but it's not the right thing for everybody. Um, and I think that's probably why we haven't seen some of these um, you know more widespread. You know, I mean, we, we when I was in training, we did several uh, face transplants at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, um, but you don't really see that as a. I mean, I I kind of thought. 10 years later, maybe, maybe we'd be seeing them everywhere all the time, you know, but I have a lot of patients who might be good candidates for vascularized, uh, you know, for a face transplant, but we just don't do them. Um, okay. It's just, they're so expensive and, and, and there's a lot of uh, long-term complications that patients face with that. So. But it is, um, I think you, you wrote a bit about this where when technology becomes possible then the your the ethical debate shifts and it's no longer right. about whether you know it's the right thing to do it's just more about the access to this resource and right uh, yeah who, who gets it? yeah it's interesting so when, when something becomes mainstream then it's sort of well who who has access to it and who doesn't um it, it's it's interesting too because some of this gets around um you know what is innovation and what is experimentation um, you know, as surgeons, we, we're, we're improvising every day, right? The plastic surgeons, what we do, why we love coming to work every day is because we're improvising something in the OR, is, you know, we're, we'll walk in to reconstruct a case and we'll look at something and go, wow, I didn't, that was not what I was expecting. And so we come up with something on the spot, right? It's kind of, uh, we enjoy using our knowledge of the, of the human body and, and how to push the limits of blood supply to fix problems. Um, and so we're improvising every day. And a lot of times we'll do something innovative, right? That maybe no one's done before. Um, and then we start doing it again and again, and then we, or maybe two more times. Then we present our case series of three things at a conference and now it becomes, you know, what everyone does. Like I think of, of the Millard rotation advancement flap or cleft lip repair. Millard just came up with it. He did it on a couple of kids and talked about it. And everyone said, wow, those results are really good. Leonard Furlow and, and doing a palatoplasty, the Furlow double reversing Z-plasty for, for palatoplasty. He presented a few cases that he had done. And then about nine months later, a group at uh, Penn, University of Pennsylvania, you know, presented their, their data on like a hundred patients that they had done. No, no, no trials, just, you know, you innovate and then everyone accepts that it's a cool thing. Um, but, but what's interesting is, is when we're innovating on patients and, and, and that sort of thing, when is it, when is it crossing the line between experimenting? Mm. And, and I think that you know, human experimentation uh, has a bad track record uh, <laughs> of ethical violations. I mean, some, some people, you know, I, I study the history of, of, of ethics in, in, in medicine. And a lot of times the history, well, it's the case that if you study, pick up a book on the history of medical ethics, you're reading about the history of the horrors of human experimentation uh, and people not getting consent and people treating uh, other people as means to an end. So I think we, one of the interesting things about tra face transplant, uterus transplant, hand transplant, sometimes we're sort of experimenting to see what happens when we do this repeatedly in a wide Well, patient. really, without experimentation, you wouldn't yeah. have innovation. So right. <laughs> it is interesting. Oh, it's so. Yeah, yeah. You have to, the, the question is, the experimentation has to do with, um, the, the distinction that I draw is this, experimentation is about generating new knowledge, and so experimentation is, is critical, and so you can experiment, and um, you have to decide, you know, what's ethical 
what populations are ethical to experiment upon. Um, uh, and so a lot of times we just, in, like innovation just becomes mainstream practice without that, that generalizable knowledge. When we innovate for our patient's sake, like we, we use a new technique that we think is gonna benefit our patient, it's the benefit to the patient that we're prioritizing on, you know, not, not the generation of, of new knowledge. That's why it's so challenging for surgeons to actually do real science because it's really difficult for us to randomize our patients uh, to uh, an arm of, of, of something that we would think is, you know, we would never, it's very challenging to get surgeons to randomize their patients to, uh, you know, the draw of a number out of a hat about what arm they're going to, what kind of treatment they're going to get or what kind of surgery they might get. We had this very fa um, fascinating discussion with Peter Nelligan only a few months ago, and um, he talked about, you know, cowboy cowboys in plastic surgery, and one of his mm -hmm. heroes was what, Tessier, I think it was, because yeah. he killed a couple of his patients um, trying to de develop a new technique, and that was, yeah. oh, you know, it's pretty shocking. But it, it, what you said kind of brings me to the, the, the next question I had, which was, about honesty among surgeons you know you go to conferences and everyone's showing all their best results and you know you can't help but think well really um and i wonder and of course everybody wants to you know advance their careers and um serve the ego and so on that, that how does how do we as a community kind of police that a little bit and just help ourselves be more honest with each other and and the patients yeah, it's challenging. So my, my senior partner here at the University of Michigan is a guy named Steve Buckman. I don't know if you've ever been in a meeting with him. He's getting up at the microphone and yelling at someone, uh, usually about their data being junk or, or that they're there. <laughs> so, so, so there's a few people who are willing to stand up and, and be the skunk at the picnic, I guess. Uh, but I think that, that that sort of robust discourse where we're calling each other out is sort of patients, we deserve, patients deserve us to to behave that way. I think, I mean, not to be aggressive with one another, um, and he can be sometimes aggressive with people, but I think to, to, um, to have open and honest discourse and not just to sort of, uh, you know, pretend that, that, that it's pro something's progress or, or whatever when it's not really. Um, and so again, I think that um, it's sometimes challenging to, to disagree with people uh, openly. Um, but I think that that's, uh, you know, the community of surgeons uh, should hold one another accountable for, for this sort of thing. Um, yeah, sometimes our culture can be unethical because of the way yeah. we train surgeons. It's a lot about um, showing or proving good results or trying yeah. to obtain something that may be very difficult to obtain. And then I think dishonesty becomes something that may be prevalent. I mean, I yeah. suppose a lot of it might be imposter syndrome. You're always trying to be the better surgeon um, for yourself, but also you want to gain the trust of the patients as well and your colleagues. Um, and, uh, and so I suppose it is difficult to then be totally honest with yourself and, and those around you sometimes. And, uh, you yeah, know, well, I think that, that gosh, that honesty thing, you got to, if you, if you start to lose grip of that, then you're lost, I think. So, yeah. I mean, <laughs> because <laughs> you're not going to fool anybody much longer. If you, if you keep having bad results and, or, you know, and you, you have to be honest with patients, you have to admit your errors. You have to, you know, if you, if you don't know what you're doing, you, you need to ask for help. Um, I think that's the, the, the road to hell is, is lined with, with, with thinking that we're going to get away with something uh, by not being completely honest. Um, it's interesting when you're thinking about bad outcomes and showing your best results. Uh, Bob Goldwyn, a long time ago, uh, 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 he was the editor of Plastics and Reconstructive Surgery uh, a few er uh, eras ago, but he wrote a book called The Unfavorable Result in Plastic Surgery. So it was a whole book on how operations can go wrong and how to try to prevent them. You know, and it, I feel like you would never see anyone do that and actually he caught a little flack uh from i know some of the other surgeons who knew him and said yeah he was you what a what a dumb guy who would write about how to mess an operation up uh but but you know that, that's something that, that would be refreshing right and sometimes and occasionally uh, you'll see talks where um 
where someone with a lot of gray hair and who's already well respected will say, here are some of the, my worst mistakes I ever made. Massively educational. And I right. think we don't have enough of that, actually, because you can learn from other people's mistakes, but people often don't feel very willing to, to share those openly. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. So I had a, uh, at Emory University, I had a, a mentor there, a guy named John Banja, who wrote this book called Medical Errors and Medical Narcissism. Um, and he, he talked about how the, the problem is, is that in medicine, we have a view of ourselves as perfect, or we hold out a vision of ourselves. So this is like the, the myth of Narcissus, who's, you know, uh, looking at the beautiful reflection uh, in the pond. We hold out this, this vision of perfection for ourselves. And we certainly do in plastic surgery, maybe more than anywhere else, right? But, um, and, that we, and that's what we strive to be, is this, this version of ourselves that's perfect. And when anything happens in reality that, that shakes that vision of ourselves as this perfect you know, surgeon, um, it, deep, it affects us deeply psychologically. And we try to run from that, pretend it didn't happen, only show our best results at conferences, uh, you know, <laughs> and that sort of thing. And, and he sort of says it's the psychology of who we are and what makes us want to go into medicine um, and, and something and just to be named to, to sort of say that we should be on guard for that and um, not let it affect how we talk to our patients or how we report errors and that sort of thing. Yeah. So, we're, you know, we're talking about, I suppose, maintaining a facade of perfection yeah, amongst colleagues in conferences, but but you also wrote a very interesting article about how to disclose harm causing medical errors to patients. Yeah, can you give us a summary of the kind of um, the ethical dimensions to all that? Well, you know, part of this too, I think, is that you know, as surgeons, we sort of take responsibility for our actions um, because we can't pretend that we're not that we're not somehow in that causal link, or you know, the. the <laughs> You know, we were in the operating room, you know, holding something. We did, we did something to him. So, um, you know, the um, the idea about that is that really, you know, you should disclose errors uh, to patients, apologize for it, and then work to make it right uh, for them. Um, and I'm lucky enough to be at an institution, the University of Michigan, kind of, uh, and not invented, but popularized this this model of disclosure, apology, and um, sort of making it right for the patient by either paying for their medical bills or giving them some sum or whatever, uh, or you know making sure that all other care was was covered. Um, that that's that became sort of the way that the healthcare system here um, just managed all medical errors, uh, and and it became what's called the Michigan model. But I think fundamentally. Um, you know, it's, if you don't, if you have a system where you're covering up errors, then that's actually flawed because you're never going to, it's going to, things are going to have a downward spiral. So, I mean, it, the, the idea of building um, institutions that have a culture of openness uh, and that get away from blame and shame. I mean, that's the, the problem is that actually surgeons are often, uh, we're told that we are responsible for the blame and shame Thing because we we hold each other accountable for things and and um, uh, because again in my training too you we, you know you said that you would stand up at morbidity and mortality report and say I I made this mistake and um, you know you felt the heat uh, of of getting asked hard questions about why you made such a horrible mistake and and some people would call that being shamed and they say well then that forces people to not want to talk about their errors um, so this idea of if you build a culture of disclosure. An apology, then errors can be out in the open. We can figure out what uh, and how to change the system to prevent them from happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, and and um, I think we're we're getting close to the hour. Oh. Um, just <laughs> so many things to talk about. So fascinating. I wondered whether we can kind of close to um, by exploring a bit about the future of ethics, because clearly the um, medical ethics evolves with societal changes and cultural changes and and you know um and all sorts of things in in the future we're going to have a very multicultural society we already do but but at the same time seemingly more polarized <laughs> how how is ethics going to grapple with that in future what do we need 
to ensure that we as a community of healthcare providers provide the kind of care that patients deserve and in the most ethically just way? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there are a lot of ways I could answer this, but I'll tell you though, as I think that um, I like, you know, for, as, as surgeons, I, I think about the way Aristotle talked about right and wrong. Okay, and so he's he's credited with with virtue ethics, um, and this Aristotelian there's this Aristotelian idea, or, or there, there's you know we, we there's there's knowing the right thing which is orthodoxy, and there's doing the right thing which is orthopraxis, uh, and then there's choosing. So we might all know what the right thing to do is, but sometimes it's hard to do the right thing, and I think about that in terms in developing uh, this idea of phronesis, which is developing practical wisdom to always choose the right thing in any given situation. I think as surgeons, we're always working to develop that phronesis of choosing the right decision in the situation, you know, as it relates to our patients. And so I think that, you know, um, it, it can be, uh, as Rebecca mentioned, sometimes paralyzing to think about the larger, you know, policy related issues and what should I do. But if we focus on you know, doing the best thing for the patients that were, that are entrust that are entrusting us uh, to their care, then I think that's one way um, for us to go forward. Um, and you know, the reason that why some people don't like virtue ethics is it's hard from it's hard to find policy solutions uh, using that mentality of of the person of each of us developing the virtues to be the best version of ourselves and in in society. Um, but uh, it, it is it does focus on like what each of us can do um, in terms of taking care of our patients and, and living virtuous lives vis-a-vis -vis the patient. Mm -hmm. So here's a question: What's okay. the most difficult ethical problem you you've ever had to contend with? <laughs> well, I mean, that's an interesting. Uh, Difficult in terms of like my safety uh, uh, being threatened was <laughs> difficult in terms of decision to make. Like you describe yeah. yourself giving advice as if, well, I know what I would do, but there must be situations where you really have been contemplating and found it difficult to decide what you think is the most ethical way forward. Or maybe not. <laughs> well, I think. What I find very difficult is when I think that, um, or difficult, when I think of the, some of the most difficult situations are when I think that there's a clear ethical violation occurring um, and sort of no one wants to change course. So that's uh, like in when uh, a good example of this that, that actually covers many different scenarios that unfortunately I've seen is when uh, kids, young children are either brain dead or very close to being brain dead. Uh, you, you guys dealt with the Charlie Gard situation. We've had some situations yeah. like that. We've had court orders to keep brain dead people alive. Um, and a bunch of things are being done to the body that aren't benefiting the person, the patient. And I think that that's fundamentally, uh, and people feel that, you know, because uh, so Emmanuel Kant says that you should always treat people as um, ends in themselves and never only means to an end, right? So you should never treat someone as means to an end, as merely means to an end, right? You should always treat others as ends in themselves. And when we, when you have clinicians and practitioners doing things to a, a either a moribund patient or a, a dead patient because the family wants you to, you're treating them as means to an end to either avoid a confrontation with the family or to avoid a lawsuit. Um, and to me, that feels horrible. And I try to tell everybody, you gotta stop this. This is treating the patient as merely means to an end. You're not doing anything to this person that's helping them. And so it's, it's like the height of, of disgust that, that, you, that everyone feels, actually everyone in those situations, they feel horrible and they don't know how to articulate it. But those are difficult for me because it's challenging in the US environment to, to sort of unilaterally uh, stop 
um, doing things to patients when their families are requesting it, even though it's not benefiting them, it's, it's maybe torturing them. And do you think sometimes those cases may arise because of differences in perception or values and breakdown of communication and that perhaps they could have been avoided if there was better mutual understanding? I hope so. Sometimes sometimes it really is just a complete different a complete difference in worldview of like patient's family and then of our scientific worldview or you know your medical uh, conceptualization of what is appropriate uh, use of certain medical interventions. Um, and so sometimes people are just like speaking two different languages, uh, sort of metaphorically, uh, that, that, um, and so they can't be resolved. I, I mean, that's certainly what we strive to do is to fix those broken points of communication so that everyone can understand the same things. But sometimes, again, what's challenging is that you'll feel like, well, we, we said all the right words. Why don't, why, why don't they understand or why aren't they coming around to my point of view? Um, but we certainly, again, just to mention about what we do as part of our ethics consultation service is we actually do this thing called proactive ethics rounds. So in all the intensive care units, my team goes around and like rounds with the nurses and social workers and, and doctors, and they talk about patients and try to find areas that we think, okay, this is, you know, this is going to turn into a fire. Let's, let's extinguish it now. Or what, what can we do proactively? Uh, to enhance communication so that we don't end up in a situation where uh, everyone's fighting and, and arguing about what to do at the end of a patient's life, for example. Mm. Can I ask you a question just re regarding um, the death penalty and doctors' involvement oh. in administering <laughs> lethal injections? Uh, is that wrong? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I think it's I think it's wrong. But uh, so I have a very specific view of what doctoring should be about. Uh, you know, so people who disagree with that uh, will, uh, will come to a different conclusion. But I think that you know, what is it? What is the goal of medicine? Is to promote human flourishing. And when we take on the the mantle of the profession uh, of medicine, um, that we shouldn't be involved in any people's lives because they they're not going to flourish. <laughs> So that involves death penalty. I, I, that's also why I think that physicians probably shouldn't euthanize people. Uh, it, you know, if people want to have someone else euthanize them, that's probably fine. But I think it's con it's confusing to um, to try. I, I think it's slippery to to define the ending of someone's life as within this uh, definition of human flourishing. That I think is the goal of medicine. It's how I, th I think it's how we get to do what we do in plastic surgery, you know, um, because some, you know, some physicians might say that some of the things that we do is frivolous. Uh, but we say, and I say, well, I'm promoting human flourishing. My patients are better off after uh, I put them through an operation and they can live better lives. And, you know, with that, whatever deformity or, or malfunction that they have is improved. And so that's actually, I think, to me, within the bounds of the appropriate definitions of medicine that, i think that's a really good place to finish there the um your definition of what medicine's about i mean there's okay. so many other things to talk about and i'd love to just carry on i think probably go for go on for another few hours um but maybe next time yeah i'd love to great well thank you so much and i hope everyone else enjoyed that um we, we'll be putting up the recording and make it available on our youtube channel so it's just on stoke manville plastics and we'll put it on our stoke manville plastics.com website too it's a very so, thought-provoking evening yeah thank you, thank you christian thank oh you, yeah christian. that's my pleasure thank you so much i hope I, I, didn't get, I hope i didn't get too philosophical i probably did that's what we wanted. <laughs> Perfect. Have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. All right. Have a good evening. Take care. Bye. Bye.